First John chapter 2, and this is really a continuation of the last time I got a chance to preach. I was supposed to cover all six verses, and I didn't, so I am coming back. These verses somewhat stand alone, although there is a connection to the, what precedes it, and we'll talk about that a little bit. By way of introduction, I just want to really call your attention to the concept of relationships and the obligation that relationships bring. When you enter military service, you've created a relationship that has obligations. I've not been in the military, but as I understand it, if you join the Marine Corps, when you're in the Marine Corps, you don't necessarily decide where you're going and when you're going there. You now have a new relationship that says when the Marine Corps says you go and where you go, that's where you go. If they want you in... Japan, you go to Japan. If they give you a break, you can come home. If not, they want you somewhere else you go. There's obligations that go with the relationship. Uh, When you uh, are employed, you join an employer, there's generally obligations that go with that. Are there not? They're going to pay you, and you're going to accomplish the things for which they hired you to accomplish. They expect you to get certain things done. Your employer says, you know, this person's got the skills I need. I hire them. They create a relationship, an employee-employer relationship, and then there's things that you have to carry out. And as we look at the scripture tonight, I hope that we'll see, my intent is for us to see, as the slide indicates, that there's an obligation. Salvation comes with it. The relationship that's created in salvation. Remember, salvation is not about getting you um, out of hell. It is. But the more important thing, God wants and desired to have a relationship with us. And that was only possible through the redemption the forgiveness of our sins, which is only possible through what Christ did for us. And so if you remember, as John has been talking, he started out from the very beginning of this book talking about relationship, the relationship that we have with one another as believers and the relationship we have with God the Father. And so he presents really now an obligation, some obligation, a particular obligation that we have in the relationship that we have with God the Father. Let's look at the text, First John chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 15 to 17. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. One of the benefits of studying through a passage is that you get a sense of what the writer it has already said. And up to this point in in this letter, he has already said a number of things. He has started out by providing three sections of tests that help you understand whether you are a true believer in Jesus Christ. He begins really in verse 5, after his introduction to the first four verses of the book, in verse 5 of chapter 1 through verse 2 of chapter 2, providing a test that says in order to have fellowship with God, you need to be walking in the light. If you're not walking in the light, you have no fellowship. In other words, you need to have the same perspective of sin that God has. You need to be walking in the light. The second test we saw in verses 3 through 6 of chapter 2, where it says God requires that we are obedient to his will, his known will, and we seek to imitate him. In other words, there's an assumption that if we're going to say that we abide in Christ, I think it's in verse 6, we abide in Christ, we say we abide in him, then we need to do the things he did, walk as he walked, live as as he lived. And so that's a second test. And the third test that we saw was in verses 7 through 11 of chapter 2, where he says God requires that we love each other. If you say that you are a believer in Christ and do not love your brother, you're a liar. And so John has presented some tests, and they're really not... There's really not a lot of wiggle room in those tests. They're pretty plain. And then he comes back, and we looked at this the last time I preached, and that was the fact that he was confident in those that he was writing to passed those tests. And so he gives them that assurance, and now he moves directly in to this obligation that we have to be in harmony with the Father. We're to be in harmony with the Father as it relates to the things that we are committed to. What is it that you are committed to in your life? Are you in harmony with the Father on that? Do you love 
what God loves? And do you hate what God hates? See, that is an obligation that we have out of the relationship that we now have with God the Father. We have to be on the same page. It's, it's very simple. It makes sense. And so the question I think that we need to be asking ourselves tonight as we go through the text is this. First of all, do we recognize that? Have we recognized this obligation or have we missed it? I mean, if, if you're in the Marine Corps and you miss the obligation to show up at 4.30 in the morning with your pack on for a march and you decided to go get a biscuit at Chick-fil-A instead, um, you'd be in trouble, probably. I'm guessing that would be a big deal. Those of you who are in the Marine Corps can tell me that. I'm pretty sure that would be a problem. It's probably true for the Army, Air Force. I don't know. Maybe they have easier standards there. I don't know. No. That was supposed to be funny. Anyway. Uh, now, I'm assuming that all of our branches of the military have a similar standard. They want you where you need to be, where you say you're going to be. There's an obligation there, and you need to recognize that. And so we need to recognize our obligation. And then we really need to be careful about our connection to the world. I mean, that's the point that John is making. And we need to be careful what we allow our heart. Are we careful? Are you careful? That's the question. What are the questions tonight? First of all, do you recognize the obligation? Second of all, are you careful about your connection to the world? Are you careful about what you allow your heart to desire? And so let's, before we get into the outline, let's ask the Lord for his help. Father, we are grateful for your word and for the fact that it is very plain and clear. Lord, you have condescended in an amazing way to our level to communicate in our language. Lord, you've blessed us with your word in English. For many of us, that is our first language. And so we have the privilege to read it. And Lord, beyond that, you've given us the blessing of living in a day when not only do we have the capacity, but we have access to really volumes and volumes of study work that other men have done. And so, Father, we are a very privileged people. Of all people of all time in the church, we should be those that are practicing your truth most thoroughly. For we have perhaps the greatest access to it of any believers that have ever lived. And so, Lord, we recognize that burden and pray, Father, that you would help us tonight to listen carefully not only to the words that are spoken audibly, but to, more importantly, the words that your Holy Spirit impresses on our heart. That as we look at your word, that your spirit would illuminate the truth of it. That he would convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That he would show us the things in our heart that are not consistent with your truth. Lord, I pray that you would direct my words and thoughts to be exactly what you would have. And most importantly, Father, may you be honored and glorified through the presentation and our response to your word tonight, we pray. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so let's look then at this obligation. We're going to begin with the command. It's a very simple outline tonight. There's a command that's given, and then there are reasons for the command. And what a beautiful picture, because you get a sense of what you have to do, and then the author tells you why you have to do it. And so the command, first and foremost, is that we are to refrain from an improper love. Love, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And the tone that he sets with this is almost to the extent that he... Belie- the, the, the tone in the original language almost could be taken to mean, stop it. Stop loving the world. So in some sense, he feels like perhaps that there was an issue with his audience that he's writing to, that perhaps that was already going on. And I think if we were honest with ourselves tonight, each one of us would recognize that to a certain extent, we would need that same command, stop it. Stop loving the world. It's important that we look at several words here and see what they mean. Let's start with the word love. It's the word that's associated with godly love. It's used most often in the New Testament, really exclusively in the New Testament, to refer not so much to an emotion, but to a commitment. To a commitment that results in actions. We see, for example, in 1 Corinthians 13, the actions that this love carries out. 
perhaps a good synonym for this word in this context is the idea of loyalty. Loyalty. Uh, Loyalty implies a commitment to something or to someone. One author put it this way, that this love is establishing the intimate relations of loyalty. And so as we evaluate this command and how we are complying with it, we need to be looking for areas in our life where we are committed to something, where we are delighting in something, where we have really a loyalty to something. That's what we're looking for. That's the idea here, the commitment. Another key word is the word world. Love not, be not, don't be committed, don't have an intimate loyalty to the world. There's three words in the New Testament that are translated world in English. The first one is aeon, it means a period of time, an unbroken age, perhaps a perpetuity of time. And so we see that in passages such as Romans chapter 12, be not conformed to the world, the aeon, the perpetuity of time. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world, this, this age, if you will. That's not the word that is used here in our text. The second word is the word world that just means the inhabited earth, okay? The planet that we're on, okay? And, and Paul, I'm sorry, John does not use that word either. He's using a word that in the original language is cosmos, cosmos, or the Englishized way of saying that, cosmos, Okay. And that is an interesting word. It has the meaning of a harmonious arrangement or order or government or a system. Okay, so you get an idea of what it means. John has used this word six times in these three verses. And so he's not talking about the physical world uh, or the world of humanity. He's talking about a ordered system or arrangement. One author put it this way. It's the human race in its alienation from and opposition to God. It's the system of the world that is in opposition to God. Okay, so it's that understanding that we need. We find this word used frequently. It's interesting how it's used, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the cosmos, the ordered system that is arranged against him. God loved it. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world. Christ said, If the world hates you. And so we're talking about this word world. We're talking about the human way of life that is completely apart from God. So that's how we need to think. Now, there's another phrase that we need to look at. Notice at the end of this phrase, he says, Love not the world. And what does he say next? Neither the things that are in the world. Okay? And I think what John has done with his command there, he's made it more precise. You know, because we could say, well, we don't really love the, co- we don't really love the world system. That's really opposed. Their mindset and their thinking is completely opposed to everything that we are. And we're cool with that. We can get by with that. And John had to add the phrase, neither the things that are in the world. In other words, there may be some aspect of that system that really works for you and you really like. Maybe you're a car guy and you love cars. I'm a car guy. I love cars. If I could, I would have a garage full of cars. I really would. It would be so cool. Unfortunately, I don't have that privilege or by God's grace, I don't have that privilege. You know, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Notice we can't ignore individual aspects of this world system that we find ourselves being loyal to. He wanted to make sure, we have to be sure that we don't view his command as being too broad and miss that individual piece that we are failing in. One author put it this way, John's readers are to be on guard against a permissive or kindly feeling towards the world's evil, and they're not to establish intimate relations of loyalty with it or any particular aspect of it. And so we look at a life today where we are what? We are bombarded daily with the cosmos and the things that are in it. And we have to ask ourselves tonight, Do we love it? Do we have an intimate loyalty for it? Do you? Are you delighting in something that is a part of the world? Now, you say, well, 
What does that mean? I have to hate everything? No, that's not what I'm saying. We, we function, we are in the world. We function, we're not in some third dimension here, okay? We're physical people in a physical world. And I love a beautiful, sunny day. And the beauty of creation. We're not supposed to be angry-looking people hating everything, okay? But where is your loyalty? Where is your commitment? Are you committed to a materialistic system where you're committed to pursuing career goals and achieving all you can achieve? That, that is a part of the cosmos. What about how you use your time? Are you demonstrating loyalty to how the world uses its time? We call it entertainment today, right? You know, that is probably an area where we as believers probably struggle the most but don't recognize it. The time that gets sucked away from being filled with Rich, the scriptures richly dwelling in us. What is it? Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ do what? Dwell in you richly. How does that happen? How does something get into something? You've got to pour it in, right? You don't have a glass of tea without pouring the tea in the glass. Sounds good right now, doesn't it? A glass of iced tea. And if you are committed to have loyalty toward the entertainment system of the world, and you are not using that. You're burning time. What about human relationships? I mean, human relationships can get in the way. Yeah, they can. And so the most important thing we need to do tonight is really evaluate our hearts and say, where are we on this command? Are we refraining from an improper love. Is there some, you say, well, the cosmos, yeah, I can't stand the cosmos. That's just, you know, the way those worldly people live, that's just not me. Okay, what about the things in the world? Maybe you're pursuing something that is consistent with how the world pursues something. That is what John is talking about. And that's what we need to be careful. I love scripture. I love scripture, period. But I love it in particular when an author of Scripture doesn't just say, do this, but then behind it, he gives you all the reasons why. The Apostle Paul does that a lot. John does it here. He gives us reasons. And really, there's two sets of reasons. The first set of reasons pertains to our character as believers. Pertains to our character as believers. And we're going to look at a second set of reasons that pertain to the characteristics of the world. And so we're going to look at those two sets of reasons tonight. So the first set of reasons pertains to our character as believers. And one of those reasons is, quite frankly, our identity. Our identity. Notice at the end of verse 15, if any man loves the world, what does it say? The love of the Father is not in him. And so John immediately, after giving the command, reminds us of our relationship. If you love the world or the things in the world... Your relation, you've got a problem in your relationship. There's something that's inconsistent. Now, by, because of the context here, the love of the Father is not talking about um, uh, love from the Father or God's love for us. It's speaking of our love for God. And so those that have this relationship with God are obligated to have his mindset about things. The attitudes, the actions, the way our worldview, the way we think, needs to be consistent with the attitudes that God would have, the actions that God would have, the views of things that God would have. And therefore, the things that are not like God, not godly actions, not godly attitudes, not godly perspectives, should not be part of our lives because of who we are. And so when we have a loyal commitment to a system that is living and opposed to God, we don't have a loyal commitment to God. I mean, that's just basic. This is not rocket science. So in other words, love for the world or, or things of the world are, and love for God really are mutually exclusive. That's exactly what Christ taught, did he not? Matthew chapter 6. No man can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and hold to the other or hate the one. I've got those words backwards. Let me read it. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. James reiterates that truth and says he calls... Uh, his, his readers, adulteresses and, adult, adulterers and adulteresses. 
Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? And there James uses a much softer word, not the word that we're using here, the word love. And so we cannot have love for the Father and love for the world as believers. It can't hold sway in our heart at the same time. It's just inconsistent with the identity of who we are in our relationship with God. And so I hope that highlights just how important. I mean, this is a matter not just for those that are the super Christians in the room. This is for every believer in the room. Your relationship with God is the reason that you need to be concerned with where your loyalty lies. Your relationship with God is that significant. He also, another reason that he gives us about our character as believers is our direction. Let me turn around and look. How about that? It does work. Notice at the end of verse 17, our direction as believers. He says, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In verse 17, he talks about the fact that the world's going to pass away. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he that doeth the will of God. In other words, he that is in right relationship with God. That's what we do. We do his will. We carry out his moral will. We seek to live in his ways. We abide forever. Meaning what? What does that mean? What does the Bible say about us as believers as it pertains to life eternal? We have eternal life. When do we have eternal life? Right now. What does Paul say is in um, 1 Corinthians 5, if I'm thinking about the right book of Corinthians? If this body is dissolved, what? In 2 Corinthians 5, actually, I do have it in my notes. If this earthly house is dissolved, what do I have? I have a house in heaven. Paul challenges the Philippians, remember? He says, your conversation, your citizenship is in heaven. John chapter 3 says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You see, another reason we've got to watch out is because who we are. We are present citizens of an eternal kingdom. Our mindset should be totally different. The focus of our present reality, in other words, our present reality should focus on what is true, and that is that we are citizens of heaven. In other words, Paul says in Colossians 3.1, if we're risen with Christ, what should we be doing? Seeking those things which are above. Set your what? Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. In other words, our mindset should be completely different because of who we are because of our direction, because of our citizenship, because our future is in heaven. The passage this morning, uh, at the end of the passage that Pastor Doyle preached, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Because we have this hope. What hope? We're the sons of God and we're going to be with Him one day. Because of that, we will be like Him. And because of that, then now we need to be pursuing that. Same idea that John has here. You know what? We need to be careful about our love because because we have an eternal existence with God and that is a present and future, it's a present reality and a future certainty. Okay? So let me ask this question. How has your identity as a believer, the fact that you have a relationship with God, how has that affected your daily life? In other words, do you straddle the fence between the best of the world and the best of the Father? What are you pouring in? I Entertainment is around us everywhere. What are you pouring in? Do you spend more time on Twitter than you do in the scriptures? Some of you said, no, I have no idea what Twitter is. So that one, I'm safe. Okay, pick the next thing that you spend a lot of time on. What do you do when you wake up? What's the first thing you do? What's the first thoughts that go through your mind? Do you allow yourself the time to get, it's going to sound not the way I want it, but I'll say it anyway, reconnected with the Father? You've been unconscious for hopefully a period of time, a suitable period of time, seven or eight hours. If you're older, like I'm getting, it's intermittent pieces of unconscious time interrupted by painful rolling over because your back hurts, okay? Some of you can probably tell me how that works even better than I know, but when you are fully conscious again, anyway, are, what is your first thought? Is it, I've got all this stuff to do today, or is there a time that you take to get in tune with who God is again and 
commit your day to him and seek to have a day that will bring glory and honor to him. Or is it, you're right on Facebook checking, okay, let's see what my friends do overnight. Twitter, okay, I'm all up to date. Or do you flip on the news? I mean, that's even worse. Twitter might be bad, but CNN is way bad. All right, and I just broadcast that over the Internet. Uh, <laughs> sorry, CNN. Are we trying to live in the world but maintain our identity, love, and loyalty for God? What about your direction? Does the fact that you have a present citizenship in heaven make a difference to you? Do you really carry out what Paul says in Colossians 3 of really being focused all your priorities have heavenly priorities. Now, that doesn't mean you walk around, you know, kind of with this glow and um, you're just kind of in a spiritual fog. What's, what's wrong with him? Oh, he's, he's contemplating heaven. No, I don't, I, it's very practical. It's very practical. What is it that drives you? In other words, what is it that, that makes you go? We can answer that question, I think. Most of us can. I've got a big house that I really have to have and car and all the debt and I've got to go because I've got to pay it off. I think there's probably some of that in all of us because life requires funds to pay the bills. I understand that. But at the core, where, what, is it, what are you about? Are you about understanding that Christ's kingdom is most important? I mean, one second after you're gone... There you go. Sounds better. In the mic... One second after you've gone, all the stuff that was cosmos-related priorities is it's gone. A waste. Because Christ's kingdom is what kind of a kingdom? An everlasting kingdom. And it's amazing to me that God left us dust, redeemed dust. Can you think about that? You and me, us, this church, us as an assembly, God left us to do his eternal work. And I don't know about you, but that's ridiculous to me. Why put something so grand and important in our hands? I don't understand it. Paul didn't either. For it is by your mercy we have this ministry, is what he said. And that's how we should be, too. Lord, you've put in our hands the job of carrying out and expanding your kingdom on this earth. See, that's what should be your core, at the core, who you are. That's where your priorities have to lie. That's what needs to drive you. Yeah, you have to get up and go work a secular job and pay the... I understand that. But that's just a means to an end, the end being pursuing Christ's kingdom. And so he gives us royal... He gives us uh, reasons... Uh, that we cannot have a loyal commitment to the world that pertain to our character as believers. First of all, it's, it's inconsistent with our identity. We're lovers of God, and it's inconsistent with our direction. We're citizens of heaven. We're possessors of eternal life. He next goes on and gives us two reasons, the reasons pertaining to the character of the world. And there's two of those, and they're fairly similar. First of all, it has to do with the world's identity. Notice in verse 16, he gives us a great description of what the world is all about. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so he here in this verse really gives us a trilogy of evil perspectives that are completely opposed to and separate from the Father as a reason why we should not have the love. And so first of all, we see the statement that says the lust of the flesh, self-interest and self-sufficiency. This is the fallen craving, uh, the cravings of the fallen human nature pursued in interest of self in independence from God. It's I do what I want to do because that's what I want to do. It's the worldly attitude of independence from God and really pursuing fallen human desires. I think one of the best, expo- uh, one of the best explanations of that we find in Ephesians chapter 4. Let me read it for you, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. And here... To give you some context, Paul is challenging the believers to not do this anymore. And, but in doing so, he gives us an, a kind of a picture of what this looks like. It's there, I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. And listen, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God 
to the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. And so this self-sufficiency, this lust of the flesh, really becomes the basis for rebellion against God and despising his law. And so that's one characteristic of the world. Notice the second characteristic, the lust of the eyes, greed and covetousness. This is the craving for things that can be seen. In some cases, it's seeking things to be seen to fulfill sinful pleasure. He's re- referring to anything that entices the eyes. Um, it's the tendency to be captivated by outward and visible splendor, desire for things. And obviously, we live in a day where advertising is a medium that bombards us with why we need uh, why we need something new. I mean, just the whole car industry is, is a good illustration. I mean, they change a car every year so that you have to get the new one. I mean, I use Apple devices and they change their phone every year so you feel totally inadequate because you don't have the new phone. When it really doesn't do anything more than the other one did. That's the... That's the funny part. It still doesn't make calls very well and you know, it does all the other fun things that you do on it. Useful things. Time-saving things, right? Yeah, there's a good reason for those things, right? Okay. Notice then the third perspective and that is the pride of life. This is part of the world's identity. The boastful arrogance of self and possession. So here you see in this first, the first two aspects of the world you saw things that really were Internal and here it's out external. It's boastful, and the idea of the word is a sense that it's a vain boast. It's boasting about something you have no right to boast about. Have you ever seen someone that is boasting about something that they're really pretty pathetic about? It's a vain boast, and certainly that's what we have. That's what we have here: boasting of self and possessions. It's the attitude of self-glory of achievements, and so. Here we have, again, human life lived apart from God, having a perspective that boasts about what it has and what it does. And so this trilogy of evil perspectives summarizes really the identity of the cosmos, the system of living, human living apart from God. It's the mindset that is directly counter to a godly mindset. And so the challenge for us today as we look at this is to say, is there anything in there that that describes me? In other words, am I self-centered? Seeking really to fulfill my desires. Am I greedy? Am I covetous? Can I not stand when someone else has joy and success? Am I boastfully arrogant about what I have or what I do? And so we cannot have a loyal commitment to the world because of its identity. And notice, as we also talked about the direction of the believer, we can see the direction pertaining to the world. And that is that it's going to pass away. Another key reason for the command is really the ultimate outcome of the system of the cosmos. What will Christ do? It's a passage in Philippians chapter 2 that says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ultimately, everything was going to be brought under the subjection of Christ's authority. I've worked with some folks that are very cosmos-consumed people. And at the height of my frustration with them, I thought of this verse. One day, sir, one day, you will bow. You will bow in submission to the king. Revelation chapter 19. Just to clarify, I've worked other places than just here. So I was not referring to anybody that I work with here. I was deadly silent. I thought, now they're trying to figure out which one of the guys I'm talking about. It it was someone that I've worked with 20 years ago. So just to clarify that. See, standing down here does make a difference because I can hear how quiet it is. In Revelation 19, when Christ returns to earth, it says, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And so the fact that All that is a part of the system will be destroyed. says, listen, this is something we must not be a part of. The character, the direction of the world. I mean, how inconsistent is it for us to live a life 
toward, let me read what I wrote here, see if it makes sense. How is it for those that will live a life forever with God to have loyalty to a system that God will destroy? It doesn't make any sense. It's just inconsistent. And so John gives us the reasons, first of all, why it is important for us not to love the world. We are lovers of God. It's inconsistent with our identity. And we have a future with Him, a present reality that will be a future certainty. And oh, by the world, what we're loving is a trilogy of evil that's going to be destroyed. It doesn't make any sense. And so I want us to go back and really ask ourselves the question tonight. Have you recognized this obligation? Are there things in your life that say, you know what, the cosmos, the world system, yeah, I really don't function in that and I really don't want to. But are there things in the world that have your loyalty and your commitment over and above the priority of Christ's kingdom? You know, this morning we had 656 people here. And I'm not going to say necessarily that everyone doesn't have a reason why they're not here. There are very good reasons why there's some that aren't here tonight. But what frivolous reason would keep you away from fellowshipping with other believers and when there's a set time that as an assembly we have set aside? I mean, what possibly could be on the entertainment station at home that would supersede time in the scripture or time interacting with one? I just don't get it. Or we had, you know, we had the opportunity this morning to gather in rooms to hear God's word taught, to interact with that. And I know there's people say, you know, I just didn't want to get out of bed because that that invades my time. I was up too late the night before. Well, go to bed earlier. I mean, I'm serious. I can remember someone coming to me saying, you know what, Pastor, I didn't make it this morning. I'm so sorry. We rented a movie at one o'clock in the morning. And I was like, well, why'd you, what'd you do that for? That was stupid. I mean, seriously. And I understand Scripture does not, there's not a chapter and verse that says Sunday school is at 945. I understand that. That's not what I'm saying. But in our assembly, that's what we have right now. It's an opportunity for you to be a blessing to others. How many of you start teaching directly at 945 in Sunday school? We have one. I was hoping for no hands on that one, but... You know, we start in our class a little bit later. We start about 10, but we do it on purpose. I do it intentionally so that we have time to interact. And, I, and many times, almost every week, I have to say, okay, quiet down so that we can now... It gives us time to fellowship. I mean, part of our church life is that interacting with one another, hopefully over spiritual things, not just about frivolous things. We've got to love God because he is our father and we must not love the world because it's going to be destroyed and we need to make sure that we have purity that our heart love is is pure and i don't know you know what god has said to you tonight where has god pointed out that there's a, some aspect of it maybe you're fully committed to the world system and you say wait a minute i got to reevaluate or maybe there's just some, something in your life that you know what this has gotten out of balance this I really need to restructure my priorities. Maybe you say, you know what, tomorrow morning or as I get up out of the, when I get up when I start the day, I really need to re, restart the day correctly in prayer. And just, you know, even it's that first five or ten minutes before you get to your devotions, before you get to the shower, before you get to the oatmeal, to say, God, I need your help today. I want to walk with you today. I want to bring glory to you today. The things I have to do today, I can't do in my own strength. I want to expand your kingdom. Help me to love you as I should. And then get the oatmeal and devotions and other things. Let's pray.